Welcome, everyone, to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host, and this is Bad Batch Report, which we are covering all the episodes of season three, Bad Batch. And with me, as always, for all these episodes is my co-host on this podcast and life, Kyle Gould. That's me. You said my name. I did. There we go. Hello, Marie Claire <laughs> Gould. Hello. We are getting to the end of the season. The We are covering episode 12 and 13. You can feel it, eh? Yeah. It just feels like all of these episodes are very continuitous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say this, though. Mm-hmm. It feels like we're rushing towards an end, but it doesn't feel like we're rushing towards an ending. Right. Like, right? it feels like, like the end of one... Like, I, I don't... I don't think there's time for denouement. Is there? I don't feel like there's time for anything. I don't know. I really like because we're two episodes. Like we're basically like forty ish ish minutes yeah. away from the end. I don't. I I would have thought that. Like, I'm kind of speechless with where we're at because it, it does feel like, okay, things are going to happen. There's going to be a breakout. I literally was like, <laughs> the questions to the conclusion wrote down as a sub subsection of my notes. And I was like, is there time for Texpiracy? Was my first <laughs> comment. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's always time for Texpiracy. Who lives? Who dies? Does Omega live? What does that mean if Omega dies? What does it mean if Omega lives? What does it mean for the rest of the batch? How how do you resolve where we are into... And I, I can understand getting to a point where they they save Omega or Omega saves herself, right? Or the kids get saved. Mm -hmm. they, get, they, f they flee Tantus. They get away. They don't have a ship of their own. Yeah, it just definitely... I, I don't... I don't know what this means really from a plot perspective and where they are in the timeline of the galaxy. Right. It's still fairly early on in the rebellion. Um, Echo's been doing his whole thing. Echo spiracy as in Echo base uh, right. is totally going to be a thing. But it also makes me feel like that animation project that we have talked about in previous episodes that's like on the docket uh, feels like it's in it's like locked and loaded and it's something that they want to tell right. next that this like it's, it's yeah. ne like they're going to use characters from this and it's almost like a way to continue on the clone wars assets yeah i i feel like that is the if i was a business leader and i felt like i got enough success out of the clone wars stuff that they did for season seven and then could roll that into bad batch and then could roll that into you know x show after that like the new rebellion or like you know heroes of the rebellion or i, I don't know <laughs> i don't know and and but make this it... is definitely not a rebels into resistance process no right this they're not i i can't if they move on to something that's entirely different or they go to the high republic era like they're doing with the live action i that would shock me if they I, did that I don't think that there's enough assets in play to resolve this storyline and make you feel like it ended satisfactorily. But then also at the same point, this is Star Wars. So is any ending ever going to be satisfactory because we know the world and the stories continue? Yeah, this is something I've talked about before is that like just wait long enough and you'll see the birth, life and death of all characters in Star Wars. Um that is actually a thing, which, you know, our eldest uh, taking language arts <laughs> got to learn a term and I learned it with them because mm -hmm. I never knew that Bildung's Roman was a thing that you get to kind of see the progression of somebody's life and how that affects them in a moral perspective. And we we absolutely see that from an Anakin perspective throughout the saga. But it, it's like there is a potential that we could see that with every character. Yeah. That's so dark. It's very, <laughs> it's very pessimistic. I'm, uh, I can't help it because that's mm. what the story has become to point that out to people. It, like it ends up being this, like 
it ended it ends up oddly being more like Greek mythology than I think they ever intended it to be. Because you think about like a hero like Theseus, we literally see his like lifespan and when he went to the underworld and when he came back and like we get these like little vignettes through yeah. through the mythology that has uh, has retained and existed and come forward and that we've actually been able to find. Yeah. Theseus is probably the worst example of the Greek myths because he's literally the building's Roman of Greek mythology because you get to see the whole lifespan of Theseus. Or, it's not just like snippets and like yeah. the, the important story. There's like so many things. There's so many things. That he's like, tied into. He, he's always there. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Rex is like Theseus in many ways. Oh, yeah. Is that he just continues to con- exist in f- in further and further and further stories so that his eventually getting thrown off a cliff by a jealous king who think who views him as a rival, even though he's just a <laughs> retiree, he's a retired clone out on his swamp boat. Um, it, it, it's, it's not satisfactory, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And I think that that's the... There's two things that are the struggle with that. First, um, new reader, like people are consistently entering mm-hmm. into the Star Wars universe or they they watch the movies at one point and they're like, oh, I'll check out this show. And if you throw too much of the this is a character that has always existed and now you're running into him or her. Yeah. And you don't know the context by which that they come in at. And there's all of this history that you have to uncover. It can be uh, alienating or overwhelming to try and consume. Yeah, absolutely. And then the second thing is that means that the, the true tragedy of life in that everybody dies Mm -hmm. is always at the forefront of star Wars. Yes. And that's hard because, like, we like to think, you know, of our heroes sailing off into the sunset. But now we actually have to become a little bit more, like, spiritual, like Yoda says, like, you know, <laughs> be be happy for those that join with the force because then they are at peace and happy yeah. and with the force. Okay, they don't have Yoda. to get up tomorrow and figure out with their spouse what they're going to make for dinner. <laughs> Yeah, they don't have to. You can just sail off into the sunset. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, but in some ways, like, it's sad because you don't get to live anymore. You're just part of the entire energy network of the galaxy. Anyways, this was uh, more existential than I thought. I mean, the show is getting there, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. One one thing, though, to tie it right into the stories that we're about to talk about. Yeah, thanks for bringing that that back around. Yeah, Is that... Unlike Tantus and unlike a lot of the imagery we got in the last two episodes, Mm. this story is not going to come full circle. You think? It is a linear progression. It is, yeah. There is no circle. Like, as much as they show us circle after circle after circle, Star Wars stories don't come around full circle. They are linear progression stories. There was a lot of theories around... Star Wars being associated with ring theory uh, from a storytelling perspective for a really long time. And, you know, that was like, you know, how Anakin was a baby and then he grew into an uh, old man, but he was saved in the end. And then like ring theory was a big popular theory. Oh, yeah, um, it was huge. For a really long time. I do think that there is a potential that they could bring it back around and it's like the clones and Nala say and they're off on a different planet and it's sort of like the community is saved and i think that that's the that's that's the ending i want but i will leave it up to the storytellers to tell the story that they want to tell because i i have been very impressed with what they have done so right far. they've told an exceptionally good story that i've been engaged and interested in especially as the season ramped up mm-hmm. and as good as a story at is as it is it is named ridiculously poorly <laughs> let's get into that yeah let's start uh, shall we juggernauts <laughs> episode <What>? 12 <laughs> i don't like this name i understand the concept behind it okay the tank is called the juggernaut but is it i think so <laughs> Yeah, it's not great. Like, okay. Uh. 
<laughs> like I wasn't on your on your like the names of the episodes are not you, great. You, you did not care as much. I didn't care as much, but this one and the next one actually both bother me so much. <laughs> so, uh, okay, Just so go back to number episode now. twelve of season three. Yeah, we start out with directed by Stuart oh, Lee and yes. uh, written by Ezra W. Nachman. Um, Stuart Lee's directed a whole bunch of mm-hmm. episodes. I didn't write it down exactly as many because Ezra W. Nachman was an individual I had not seen too much. He's only written three episodes. Interesting. Yeah, this is the third episode for Ezra. So that's interesting to me in that they've they've put this exceptionally complicated pair of plot stories together mm-hmm. um and and they've asked ezra to write it i wonder how long he had to work on this to get it because i th- i honestly this may very well be my favorite episode of all of them of every single episode juggernaut of all yeah i okay yeah I, I really enjoyed both of these. Absolutely. They are a yeah. pair that hangs together so beautifully. From like the penultimate sort of pair, because we've been kind of covering these in pairs unintentionally. But this episode has some of the best one-liners too. Oh, yeah. And Rampart is a joy. He is. It This is this is perfect. Like it was such a great decision to have this happen. Considering I thought he was dead. But when they... But <laughs> Ezra has done such a good job that even the throwaway lines both offer us something funny in the moment as it progresses things and i i'll reference especially when they first land and there's the two stormtroopers standing there and they're looking absolutely bored like nothing's going to happen and one guy says turns the other guy and says hopefully next assignment we'll see some action and then they're immediately both stunned and taken out (laughs) (laughs) that that that's sort of like uh i ironic foreshadowing is is great oh it was <laughs> i'm still laughing about it i'm literally still laughing about it uh it actually starts out with cx2 though correct right with him uh bring a taxpayer bringing omega to tantus base um and you know being handed off to hemlock and Hemlock bringing her to Emery Carr and them having like the discussion about Nalise and like what has happened. And it, you know, in the end, Hemlock ends up kind of monologuing about the situation. Oh my God. He literally was like, okay, we really need to figure out all of the reasons for what we're doing and set the plot for Project Necromancer and <laughs> lays out everything in like a 90 second spiel mm-hmm, that basically mm-hmm. gives all of his plans away for forevermore. Yeah. And and like Emery seems uh, happy that Omega is back. Mm-hmm. Again, this ties to, you know, she's now the queen of the underworld. So Mm -hmm. this is an Inanna descent into the underworld, which is exciting from a, you know, femme internalized development symbolic story. It it represents coming of age and all of that. I mean, you've talked about it a ton. Mm -hmm. It's now driven ever, ever closer (laughs) Because who's in charge of the underworld? Yeah, it's Emery. And who is Emery in the anonymous? In her sister, Arash Kagal. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, the goddess of the underworld in Sumerian myth. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Inanna is the most powerful, the most it, special, the most yeah. beautiful. And Arash the Kigal. goddess of life and creation and all of that stuff. And so Inanna goes through uh, these gates because she needs to go and talk to her sister yeah. and every time she goes through a gate she's actually stripped of an adornment until she is basically completely naked yeah i don't the care underworld. about anana she gets she's a hero goes I on mean, a hero's quest we're saying that yeah anana and omega are very similar because it's like saying like a divine child a divine person and a, especially a divine femme character right and that's the parallel but we have a rush Krigal. 
Aresh yeah. Kagal is the best because Aresh Kagal <laughs> lives in the shadow of her sister the whole time, finally marries the demon lord himself yes. and becomes queen of the underworld yes. and has power in her own right and thinks that what she's doing is what's right. She's yes. she's scientifically, medically married to Hemlock. Absolutely. They have the like lord of an hell. arrangement. Yes. And Inanna descends to get her sister. Yes. And what's important is Eresh Kagal. Everybody talks about Inanna, but I feel like (laughs) what's important is Eresh Kagal thinks she has everything. Yes, that is true. And so she also wants to take everything from Inanna. Well, Inanna gets stripped going through the gates. Inanna has to make has to abase herself to be like, no, I need you to come with me. Yeah. You you have to come back. This is wrong for you. But she can't leave. Arash Kakal can. But it's it's it, it's why Inanna descends. Yeah, but she doesn't leave in the myth. Yes, well, maybe it's just like Hades Town where we just keep telling the story until she does. <laughs> well, it cuz it's what she represents to the to the uh, main character which is Inanna is this dark feminine that you have to come to terms with. And in some ways, if Omega is successful in redeeming, healing Emery, she heals and redeems that part of herself that is wounded, uh, that was an experiment, you know, all of that. And vice versa, if Emery is able to save Omega, then she's saving that inner child that was yeah. captured and was an experiment. Yeah. She has to save herself. She's the one with all the power. Mm-hmm. Uh, Omega has walked through all of the ba- all of the gates, been stripped down, been scanned with the blue lights, yeah. and is now before Arash Kagal, but Arash Kagal, Emery, mm-hmm. has to make that decision herself. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's done. We'll see if it happens. <laughs> uh, so, faced with the loss of uh omega and they have to find her crosshair finally has a plan yeah finally uh which is to find uh and capture and bring out of former vice admiral edmund rampart Mm -hmm. he has a first name yes he does he's had a first name since the first season we just didn't know it um you know what's cool about that moment Mm. is crosshair even without Omega there, Crosshair has grown as an individual and he describes his fear. Yeah. Which he was always loath to do before. No, he's he's full on expressing out emotions. And yeah. I love that we see the actual growth in all of the clones. Yeah. I didn't want to tell you about Rampart. I didn't want to tell you about this way to Tantus because I'm afraid of that path i'm afraid of having to put our trust in rampart i'm afraid of going back to tantis if we didn't have to go back why should we exactly even if we knew where it was exactly yeah yeah so he was he was denying the call that like omega and echo and other people were saying to say like hey we got to go and rescue these clones yeah and he was even like kind of standing in the way of that not giving all the options because he he didn't want to go and do it in the end they didn't have to put himself at risk i think it's fair his fear was valid yeah um but the fact that he takes the time to express it is so important and what i loved about these two episodes is how much character centric dialogue happened between the batch yeah they with their, finally talked they to each finally other finally talked and we felt things and we and we uh, we got to hear about their fears and like why right. they were upset and everything. And yeah. when Rampart joins them, because spoiler alert, he does. Oh. Um, <laughs> it just adds to it. His his dialogue with them is just as much about them as it is about anything that to do with Rampart. And it's good too because he's an outsider, and so mm-hmm. he functions as this like observational lens to what is going on with the batch, which is great. Absolutely. Um, so Rampart is uh, a captive in an imperial uh, penal sure. planet. Yeah, good old <laughs> um, Erebus. Erebus, Why or drop that name. Right, in a I place was so that has no shadows. I was so happy. <laughs> There's no darkness. 
No, There's, no. And I mean, okay. It's a again, lit desolate Again, it's place. symbolic. And so people are like, okay, but again, somebody in the writer's room has read the same books as me, certainly is familiar with mythology. This is not a name that you just drop out of nowhere without understanding what the frick it is, which is Erebus or Erebus. Erebus, yeah. Uh, is darkness. It is quite literally when chaos, nothing but chaos existed in Greek mythology, yeah. Erebus and Nyx were born out of chaos. Nyx being night and darkness. Yeah. And um, Erebus or Erebus is the fathomless depths and darkness of the universe. And so sometimes comes out in mythology as the lowest bottom level of Hades. Yeah. Right? Because everything is built on top of him. Yes. And so sometimes is called out as the underworld. In fact, uh, in one of the uh, Aristophilus uh, myths about Odysseus, he goes to, to the underworld and he says he's going to go visit Hades in Erebus. So mm -hmm. it's, it is synonymous with that. And in, in fact, it's even lower than the underworld is the lowest, lowest, lowest thing you can do go. And it's sort of like symbolic of the fact like this is the lowest thing that they can go to is to go and get Rampart, their enemy, <laughs> and their enemy who destroyed their home, like all of these things. Right. Yeah. Um, Aristophiles. um uh, Aristophanes actually uh, wrote about kind of the origins of time and origins of the gods and out of darkness and night was born love mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, black winged night in the bosom of Erebus dark and deep laid a uh, wing born egg as seasons rolled forth sprang forth the shining with shining wings of gold. So like how we picture Cupid or well, you're not Eros. Read it in the original ancient Greek. No, <laughs> uh, out of uh, like Cupid or Eris, who we typically associate being the son of Aphrodite was in some mythological versions is actually one of the oldest. Well, well, Cupid is separate from Eros. No, they're the same. Well, I thing don't. In yeah. They are the same. I mean, Cupid is the Latin version of Eros, but it, love has existed since the dawn of darkness. And from love came light and day, mm. which were the opposites of night and darkness. And it's important because when you have alchemical union, the union of opposites, the true transformation, it always happens in the darkness and that creates the potential for new things like light that is the opposite of dark and what's cool about this from a psychological symbolic perspective is that they're going to a place of death which sort of indicates that rampart himself has died symbolically he is dead Sure. He's a prisoner of the underworld. And could mean that by pulling him out of there, he's going to experience a transformation. And I mean, tra he has to be. Yes. So Rampart Demption. Because he's already been transformed. Yes. Right? By like, the experience. By the punishment. But it also shows that the Batch themselves are purposely going to an underworld situation which represents the opportunity to change within our subconscious and will hopefully change and transform and grow because of it yes and not to discount everything you just said which was <laughs> beautiful erudite and well thought out but they very easily nachman could have written he he said they buried rampart in the deepest darkest place they could and then google searched that and that's how he came up with erebus <laughs> and just because <laughs> it is coincidence does not mean that it's not plugging hey, into you, 
motifs. You you can find the metaphor. You can find like there's lots of different lenses through which to look at this, right? Um, but they've chosen Erebus for a specific reason. It just seemed weird that it was very light. Th- well, I mean, he's working with like Quills, um, like another of that that Ugnot. Ug- mm-hmm. He's working with an Ugnot. He doesn't seem to be doing anything super relevant like just moving pipes and unconnecting things and hoping yeah. that his shift is going to end soon and it's very boring and nothing happens and even the guards are bored as well and nobody ever really goes mm-hmm. there doesn't seem like there's a lot of darkness and so when you're buried in the deepest darkest place by the name of the planet <laughs> yeah it seemed very trite but then again, this is a 20 minute cartoon. So. And, and maybe they were like, we've done so many episodes that have been so dark. We need to do a light episode. It's true. Right. They could have done that. But symbolically, that's what's happening. Yes. And the fact that he is not changing. He is stuck. Everybody's bored. Nobody is progressing. That is a symptom of being in the underworld in a psychological perspective. Yeah. There's also lots of bridges in this episode. Uh, they go over them <laughs> a lot. The same bridge, right? back and forth. And they, you know, of course that represents yeah, there's communications lots of thresholds. and yeah. thresholds and unions and it changes, right? Going from one side of a bridge to another is oh i'm coming to that side of things yes and it's a limited path too which Mm -hmm. allows them structure in Mm -hmm. the writing of the story and the right like having the conflict on the bridge ties everything nicely together um for all the components and it's so beautifully done like taking over the tank the big big tire tank Mm -hmm. taking it over and then getting through the barriers and fighting the other tank (laughs) and like destroying the juggernauts in the end you know i i do think that there is something to you know erebus being a place by which you choose to work with your worst enemy to get out of like there is something in that too um i don't know i I loved it. It jived with my brain a lot. And the action was flowing. The oh, pacing great. of yeah. this, this entire scene and the entire episode goes just so beautifully from one moment to the next that like we all know that the the tank is going to go off the edge of the cliff yeah. <laughs> just when Wrecker jumps that final jump to catch Yeah, because we of- saw that in the trailer too, I think. this. Right. I was shocked this episode happened so late in the in the season. In the season, yeah. When he jumps and catches on to Hunter's hand and makes it, I mm-hmm. actually felt worry for Wrecker. Not only the fact that he hasn't had much to do, his reason of I blow stuff up and I pick up the heavy stuff He's isn't going to be super yeah. useful in this. So yeah. do we need Wreck? Could he? Absolutely. I felt it in the moment. Are you getting worried for each of them? Um. I, I I mean it's a no. I mean okay. from an it's a they they are characters in a in a set in a cartoon TV show. I'm I'm not that invested. Okay. But in that moment I thought he could die. I, I he it, wasn't going it to was, die. It was very uh yeah, it was very stressful. Yeah. These two episodes. That's what they did. They generated that stress in yeah. such a way to make you feel invested in that moment. I mean, and that's great storytelling. Absolutely. Uh yeah. Any and other uh rampart the other transport. Any other rampart lines? Not a, I don't I didn't write any rampart isms down. Um He's but a there's, joy. there was a lot of like you're going to have to trust us because we have to trust you and is something like, that Crosshair yeah. says. And just Rampart in general. And then to top it off between these two episodes, just great pacing and great mm-hmm, plot. Mm-hmm. And the complications that they added were believable mm-hmm. and enjoyable and unique. Yeah. No. And like, I like how many times they've added in 
new concepts, new planets. They've just added a lot of new to Star Wars, mm-hmm. which makes me really happy because I'm like, hey, that's not something that we've ever seen before. Or that's not a thing that we've ever, we've never been to this planet. This is cool, you know? Yep. And who saw Rampart coming back? No. I didn't see that. I'm happy. In a way, it's kind of full circle. It's like, ah, voice actor is so He's good. He's so good. <laughs> I talked about that in season one. I guess I've, I'm just here for Rampart. Because <laughs> he's not in season two at all. No, he's so not. No, here you're... I am. Once we're back, Wait, Kyle, Rampart's are you, here. Are you Rampart? <laughs> are you Trebuchet Rampart? That'd be so His good. His brother? <laughs> oh, that, the actor's just such a good job of, especially this change in the character and the the, the humility that has mm. to come upon him and the, the breaking of the facade he's of been, arrogance. He's been so uh, like brought Betra- low. Betrayed. Yeah. By his own betrayers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we wrap up with Tantus. Hemlock continues his monologuing mm-hmm. uh, about the M counts and describes how only by mixing the samples together can they produce the retained uh, M count uh, that he is after for Project Necromancer, yeah. um, which is a form of dark union, which is the idea that you um, are being used for your powers, and it's a, you know it's a it's a psychic motif that happens yep. in that somebody is using you for your energy, you know all of those para- parasites out there that you've run into and you're like oh, i just can't can't handle this person they just steal all of my good vibes absolutely that's him except his good the good vibes are omega's blood yep <laughs> but you know he he introduces uh her to the vault uh for project necromancer which uh includes the other piece of the puzzle that he is uh, not shown many, very many people, which are the four sensitive children of Eva, Jax, and Sammy. And Bairn. And Bairn, yes. Bairn. And now we have the name of the, the blue girl, Sammy. Sammy, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's really interesting that they are the colors that they are. It sort of... It, yeah. I don't know what it means yet. I'm do still wanna, trying to figure that out. about that? The colors? Yeah. Sure. So we have blue and red and green and green and yellow and white those are our five colors yes those also happen to be the predominant colors of lightsabers interesting yeah we just need a purple one (laughs) there's one purple lightsaber i'm just kidding right but like that's I, I that, saw it right away. That was inter- That's interesting. I didn't even see, think of that. Yeah. Yeah. And bear and they all kind of have I mean, I don't I don't fall into that like whole sentinel guardian stuff that I know mm. that a lot of the video games have really pushed and S- made a proponent sort to. Sort of a thing in Star e- exactly. Wars. Exactly. Um but Baron yeah. is white. Yeah. And which he's he he is the most innocent and pure and has not pl- selected a path. Yeah, which as of yet. crystals kind of all start out that way. Yeah. And we we have Omega as yellow and mm-hmm. we have the green and the blue, and then we've got red. And all of those are standard typical paths for lightsabers. Yeah. I love it. Do you have anything to talk about uh, behind the scenes for this episode or do you want to say sure. it for the whole thing? Uh, let's just jump into it now. And I only have the one individual because I'm yep. running out of people that I think would be interesting to talk about that I can find more stuff about. <laughs> um, but let's talk about Michael Brinkman, who is the sound editor for this season. Hello, Michael. Yeah. T- you like sound, so I assume you listen to podcasts. Two seasons of episode, uh, two episodes of season two, and he did all of season three wow as the sound editor uh he is currently working on the marvel rise of hydra game right now oh fun so that's pretty cool too he got his start um doing sound tech and sound design and has moved yep. now into being the full-on sound editor of the show mm-hmm. any idea what the sound editor does I know a bit about this because I know right? I have spoken with David W. Collins. And you have a podcast. 
and I have a podcast, uh, they edit all the sounds and uh, make sure that they get all put together in the right order to align to everything. What do you mean by sounds? Oh, dialogue, uh, sound effects, music. It's the entire the soundtrack. They take all of it. Yes. And then they make sure that it all works together. And that could be things like doing different levels or doing different effects on things to make it all mesh together. Yeah. Yeah. So they do not create the music. They nope. do. That's the Kiners. They do not create the sound effects themselves that's done by the other department. Yep. And they, they are not responsible for the direction of the dialogue. What they do is they meld all three of those things together. And create and, the entire soundtrack. I, I, I hate calling it soundtrack because that sounds like but just the music. That's the old school. Okay. Yeah. David W. Collins would be proud of me for pointing out that it's the entire soundtrack. Everything you hear. Yeah. Is cre- is edited and spliced together and interwoven by the yes. sound editor, and they directly report to the director and the director alone. So they get those things from those different departments who also report to the director. They get those, and then they're responsible for timing and layering mm-hmm, and levels mm-hmm. and all of the other components that come from it. And if something is missing, they go to the director. They don't go to the department directly. (laughs) So they're like, I think that there should be a rock fall here. Or I think there should be more steps because they're traveling faster. Mm -hmm. They that that is put into the pipeline. Director director says, yeah, do it or no. Oh, yeah. Or no. Uh, I don't care. Or we don't have enough money for that. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe not for a few more steps. But yeah, things like, you know, know, an additional sound cue or we've repeated that or something. That's a change request. And we've been told we can't do that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Right. We've run out of budget because the the production manager has said, you know, post-production director has said, there's no more money. (laughs) No more money. Yeah. Sorry. So they're as well one of the final people that's involved in any given episode, but they're also there from the beginning as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like Skywalker Mm -hmm. Sound has an amazing library of sounds and like an entire repertoire of how Star Wars sounds. And having Ben Burt's voice as R2-D2 in like a like synthesizer machine. Absolutely. They have a way to make R two D two sound like R two D two, and Michael Brinkman plays the drums. That's that's all I can. Oh find. well, not as cool as some of the other people with their own in- online interactions and stuff, but that's what you get. That's awesome. Yep. So Hello. thanks for all your hard work. Thank Michael you, Brinkman. Michael. The show always sounds amazing. It does. Uh, okay, let's move on to Into the Breach, which is episode thirteen. Blech. I don't understand this name either. <laughs> And so I'm going to just, that's all I'm going to say about that. But so if it is a Henry five quote, <laughs> okay, once yeah. more into the, the breach, dear friends, yeah, once, more, once more, yeah, then it is saying we return to war. It is we have had this brief respite away and yes. now we will go back to battle, back to we, battle. We okay. Ha- and we have this, we have to, but this is the charge into the gap in the wall to hold those vile Englishmen off, right? This is this is that final charge. Okay, you but, sold me on it. But that's not what this is. <laughs> it's one once more into the sneaky breach. This is th- <laughs> we're going to sneak into the breach. <laughs> this is finding a path. This is I forging guess. the way, like. I, I don't know. Proximity sensors off would have been a better <laughs> title than this. I still I still agree with you that uh, using a quote from the episode is probably going to be it, just a recommendation, guys. Like I and and everyone in Lucasfilm, I love you so much, but like using a quote from the episode might actually be a better way to go about this. Yep, I, I don't. I don't see it. Um, also, the Into the Breach is Omega climbing out of Tantus, right? Finding the opening and yeah. climbing up. 
but that also doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, 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 there's a behind the scenes book, I think, coming for Bad Batch. I, I think it would be really interesting to read about it mm-hmm. and see maybe if you could decipher why the names are the way they are, but it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, we start out with Rampart and uh, him being like, just his his self. Oh, I love him so much. <laughs> well, actually, we started with Tantus, the top-down oh. view. What was cool was in Juggernaut, we started with a side view of Tantus. Right. We now get the top view, and we see that there are multiple circles that uh, lead down to Tantus. So we're getting the full circle effect here. I mean, do you want to talk about that first? Or do you want to... like Because the, the circles, to me, are really important. I mean, they are important just as much as everyone has a beard or a mustache in this episode. <laughs> no, I I mean, okay. So Why? if you want to talk about circles, I think we should also talk about the pre- the preponderance of facial hair. We did notice a lot of facial there's, hair there's in this a, episode. Like, literally, an evil mustache man is the first person we see as after the Tantus scene. We're on Tantus, we come back to Tantus, it's evil mustache man. <laughs> I was like, who is this person and why are they so evil? He just has a mustache. I've talked about how the front view of Tantus looks like the subconscious, Mm. conscious, ego, super ego. The the iceberg. Yeah. The iceberg, right? Um, When you look top down, you actually get the concentric circle view as you go through the mountain into the mountain, which is um, young pictured the self. So the total picture of your whole whole self uh, from a conscious unconscious total picture as a circle because Plato called the soul a circle. Mm-hmm. And so Campbell actually talks about this in a bunch of his lectures on how Jung interprets these things and how it relates to his own theories, which is that when you go on to a psychological change journey and adventure where you journey into your own subconscious so if you're going on an external one you're battling very visible demons if you go on an internal one you're battling your own demons uh but it's still that you're going into a version of your own subconscious which represents the wisdom of the body and when you go deep enough into the center you're directly going to that lowest layer where everything is broken down and you experience a, a newness, a freshness, and a, and a chance to start from scratch. And in fact, the vault represents the lowest layer for us as the audience within Tantus. And it shows where from a social ecological perspective change starts so there's a lot of social ecological models on psychological change and how you need to start change with the individual and then that goes into social networks which is a circle up and that goes into the environment and that goes into the like the community and the government and affects the ecosystem or the 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 larger galaxy at large and so by drilling down in this way we're focused on how omega is the key to change the bigger picture that's all i had to say about circles also everyone was talking about them because it was such an interesting angle to look at tantus and the mountain. Yeah, while you were talking about that, I was literally trying to remember all of my late 90s English literary <laughs> stuff because there's a lot of talk about the circle but uh, and the soul being the circle and there's a lot of con... By making the construct, the construct can't hold because it's not meant to exist, right? It's, right. it's just a literary device to allow you to have a further to have for to further thought and conversation and um 
a component of that is therefore that like the central idea of that doesn't even exist within the construct of it. And so there's this like this central structuralism and post structuralism and centralism and, <clears throat> and decentralization that yeah. comes from these literary analysis and ways of thought that it's like, and I couldn't help but think like, I don't think Tantus goes any further below the surface than the mountain itself, because I think that literally she's just there at the base level and she's going to climb up to the top from her vault, because I don't think it's any lower than that. I think it doesn't go deeper than the size of the mountain. (laughs) It's just like the Bad Batch itself. It doesn't go any deeper than what we can see on the screen already. Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) But suddenly everyone has a mustache. Everyone has a beard. (laughs) And circles. He's so many, be- so many beards and mustaches. I didn't start a mustache beard count. Um, unlike l- last episode, I actually <laughs> did do a death count. Yeah. Um. So I, I need to jump back there because there was, in fact, a death count oh. this episode. Okay. It is this previous episode. Nobody dies in in Into the Breach, but in Juggernaut, people died. Yeah. How many people? Did Five did people it, uh... died five death count just move right through it It, that during that conflict five people died man not prettily either yeah blown up yes one person blew up in a ship two people fell off the or three people fell off the edge of the cliff and one person was crushed against the between the wall and the tank oh man so five people died in total that is your death count uh so back to rampart yes He's a joy. Yes. Glorious bearded Rampart. Very. um, He doesn't think that the Bad Batch can do anything, which Mm -hmm. is which is great. Uh, He's uh, the the doubting Thomas of of the crew. Right. Uh, And then Echo arrives. The the most doubting Thomas of anyone. Yeah. (laughs) Except, you know, he's also like, let's just get this done. We got to get this done. Yep. Um. And the plan is to sneak into this space station mm-hmm. that is uh, in orbit around Coruscant, which is so cool. And yep. I don't remember seeing this. Well, we saw it earlier in the season. No, I know we saw it Emory earlier. Picks up Bear. No, I know, and now we know why that happened. Yeah, I know that we've seen the space station in Bad Batch before, but I was trying to remember if we had ever seen it. No. in anything else no i don't think so like it makes perfect uh, sense that there are stations uh, that are in orbit to coruscant that yeah. makes perfect sense to me it just uh, wasn't a thing that was in like the prequels and no i do like we don't really well, go probably to gets coruscant blown up before yeah. the the sequels <laughs> fair and it's not like we go to coruscant all that often in the in the original trilogy no, we so don't. yeah uh so the plan is to sneak aboard uh with stolen ship, so stolen shuttle, and stolen imperial codes, to give cap and with a stolen uniform and a stolen uniform, and Rampart's like insulted. It's a captain's uniform. I, it was such a great moment. Uh, and per- what you used to be an imperial, so impersonating one would be easy enough. Yeah, but this is a captain's uniform, and I was a vice admiral. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and then they show us throughout because he then constantly plays with his captain's badge because it's and it's always a little askew it's he can yeah. never get it balanced right because it's not as big and doesn't have as many red and blue squares on yeah. it as his vice admiral one did i mean it was excellent like characterization <laughs> choices for the animation oh. uh also they show how he's able to like really pull in his high status and talk the talk mm-hmm. of knowing the things that he knows yep. and everyone is ultimately impressed and going along with it. And it's like, like, this is like, if we were talking about an RPG, this is a high level character pretending to be like a lower level character, but he's got all the stats. So he rolls exactly. successes all the time. And he has all the inside knowledge. Exactly. Um, uh, the batch themselves strip their armor of all of the markings, of the which is a significant thing from a from a symbolic motif perspective in that they are experiencing an ego rebirth because their persona their outward facing persona that they view and associate with themselves is being washed away lasered away exactly 
And, and so those uniforms look so much like the shadow clones. Right. Uniforms now. And so that's really important because basically you're going into the underworld. You're on the way to the underworld. You experience an ego disillusion. Your ego is being dissolved away mm -hmm. uh, as part of the journey into the underworld. And but the good thing is, is that this is your chance to fully become whole with these subconscious parts of yourself mm -hmm. and so the fact that we think that tech is a shadow clone and now they match the shadow clones means that they're all kind of on the same level psychologically and this is an opportunity for them to bring tech back out of the underworld it was literally they were so a uh, un unique unified and similar yeah. Except for Wrecker, who was hiding on the this ship. This is huge, yeah. That when Echo makes the decision to go and breach the science vessel and get right. aboard it, yeah. I we were watching it on the TV. The sun was there, so there's those pieces as well. But for the first five minutes of that happening, I literally thought it was Hunter who was doing it. Right, because like, they it look so similar. It makes better sense that it would have been Hunter anyway because he's the skilled one at, at getting where places sneakily. Yeah. That's not what they actually needed. But Tech is the droid. Tech is the one that looked yeah. like he basically sensors detect him as a droid. One yeah. of those R2 units speaks to him as though he's another droid. Yeah, he is like, yeah. And then also like when he's like uh, scomp linking into, into the, you know, a terminal. It sounds so dirty. Uh, I'm coming back to season one. It's I know. such a dirty <laughs> word. Scomp link. Um... <laughs> Yeah, but like he gets in there terrible. and then and then they're like, oh, there's a random droid in the cargo hold. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, oh, OK, yeah. But and so like, again, that's like an, another show of of even Echo being stripped of his identity. Exactly. Because he's only a droid. Mm -hmm. He is not this like weird hybrid version that has been created. He's not Echo. He is just a droid. And so like they do the sneaking in and it comes to the point where. They can't get the data that they need. So he goes in and he he's like, okay, I'll get the coordinates and then you'll follow or you'll get, you know, and I'll I'll tell you right away. But that doesn't work out. It was like everything that they tried just didn't work out. And there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Because you have to go the hard path. Mm -hmm. You have to go the path that is like quite literally piggybacking onto or going into the belly of the whale. You have to make that choice to like jump wholeheartedly into what is happening. And then hopefully in the next episode, mm -hmm. they will, they, the, the science vessel will jettison their garbage before they, as they go into orbit. Right. And I'm hoping that the, something relates to that. Because that will be a direct tie to Empire. Empire Strikes Back. Well, they do it before they jump into hyperspace. Right. In that they one. jettison but, their but trash. But it would, it would be great if that, that happened and they well, jettison their trash. We have to wait trash. until they jettison their trash and then we'll come off and, then and we'll they come, just be viewed like, as their garbage yeah. as they go into orbit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm hoping that was that was their reason for doing that because it's so connective, right? Like I saw those. Mm -hmm. I saw that... Um, that direct parallel immediately. Yeah. And then they're like, okay, so they're, they're attached and they worked backwards from there. Yeah. Um, the, this, we were both like on the edge of our seats. I know you had watched it before and you kept on looking at me when I was watching it. Oh God. And I was like, I, I literally am like on, I'm full of anxiety because of it. And I'm like, they got to be able to get there. It can't just be echo, you know, all of these things, but it felt so, powerful that they managed to like you know hook up with the ship and like yes go into hyperspace it was with great it. the only person who didn't have anything to do was really hunter except for make the decision at the end of the episode to trust echo would get the job done yep yeah everybody else had something to do everybody had yeah. something to do rampart record, record echo, had that cool scene with the guy to knock out the lieutenant and put his hat back on his head yeah that was great Just so good and all of them got to interact in one way, shape, or form with yeah. Rampart mm -hmm. to, sh to basically show how each of the batch is different in their own outlook and their own wants and how they interact with this former enemy now turned 
reluctant require, reluctant ally. ally yeah and um, and Radford's like we're going we're we're going it's like yes we're going yes. yeah so it'll be interesting to see because like now they're going to this they're going to what we have uh sort of understood as the the big place of the curse yep right and the curse that is on all clones and uh this curse of consumption and destruction and everything like that and so they they head off into hyperspace and we get more from omega and she's figuring out how to leave with the tubes yep the tubes (laughs) she sees her path she sees her path and certainly she has convinced the other kids to help her out i also loved that it's pointed out that emery is on nalise's advice caring for the children Mm -hmm. i really love that um it'll be interesting to see what happens next because i don't omega is the type of person that she's not going to leave people behind so i again like she's (laughs) i I don't think she's going to leave the kids behind, especially. And maybe that's how this turns out is just they save the kids. Um, I hope that they save the clones, too. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, yeah. how could you not if they don't? This is a kid's show. I know it's it's hard, though. There are tiny tots that are eight and 12 year olds who are watching this bad batch and it is their first experience with star wars and hopefully it's their first the experience with star wars that they care about star wars right yeah i hope so i think omega is like a great character i agree and i think mm-hmm. Jax and sammy and eva all have even in their small lesser dialogued characters they kids are going to see themselves in those kids oh they're going to do the jedi path next i i don't know but like i will with, jump in while but, you're pondering and but let no you know no ventress the, and sorry i will jump in and let you know that the imperial cl- the imperial ship that echo stole and brought for them to fly around in is a row class ship rho row class there you go just throwing that out there for you oh that's cool yep is it i don't know <laughs> i i just thought it was neat yeah but let's talk about dr scalder so, yeah, we get, like, a shot of this mustache, dude. <laughs> no, Dr. Scalder's the lady doctor. Oh, the lady doctor. Oh, yeah, no, no, who's judgmental and is yeah. like, what is happening? I, I'm suspicious. Yeah, she's there's suspicious also, of clone lady, also for sure. a mustache guy. Yes. Ba- and, and it was very, like, 1970s. Yes. Like, very classic Star Wars mustache guy. <laughs> I know. There was another mustache guy. The people on the, the, the station, vessel, the station. Beards. Oh, the station has a name, too. Do you want to know what the station is called? I think I knew it what the station is. Imperial Station 003. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did know that. Know that, yeah. Um, so the Imperial Station 003, a bunch of the Imperials all had beards as well. I mean, maybe it's just like they're in season right now. So, you know, like a bunch of my uncles, when it would get to winter, they'd be like, I'm not shaving because it's cold because we live in Canada. So maybe it's like that. Or maybe they're, they're all cold doing they a space. beard growing thing kind of like, like Charles November. did. When he when he went on the trip and left Queen Elizabeth behind and he had to take all the men. And so they because they were now in uncharted waters and they didn't have any cameras on them for six weeks, they all had a beard growing contest. Are you talking about the queen or the crown? I'm Yeah, I mean, the, the <laughs> are you talking happened. about the crown? OK, yeah, but uh, yes, um, sure. Uh, or it's the imperial version of a of the charity event to grow a beard, yeah, or something, and then absolutely they have to style it really cool with like mustache wax, and that's my thoughts. I that's agree. my head cannon. <laughs> what is the what is the charity that they're all donating to? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, this episode was directed by Saul Ruiz. Oh, Saul Ruiz, fourteenth episode of directing. The Welcome Bad back. Uh, he's already done a couple this season. Um, but the the writer of this season was actually Brad Rao. Oh, interesting. Himself. And he hasn't written a whole lot. Two episodes. Yeah. Two. This is a really well written episode. Supervising director. I know. Brad Rao. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like Jennifer Corbett yeah. and Brad Rao. And he wrote this. This is great. I don't doubt that he had to work in tandem with Ezra Nachman on this. Yeah. They so, tie well together. Yeah. And like, especially like the Rampart one liners yep. are great. Uh, oh my God. There's so many good 
one-liners from in here and especially when they call rampart a uh, hydro snake i was like this is a great insult i'm keeping that for forever more it's like calling someone an eel but yeah. now it's star wars made you're so a it's hydro a, snake. you're a hydro snake yeah, yeah. right yeah <laughs> i love this episode so much me I, too i enjoyed it so much yeah okay we're done into the breach we're done juggernaut do you have any pre finale episode thoughts any any speculation any thoughts on things that we need to get out there into the universe before we get to the next couple of episodes if shadow clone 2 is tech mm -hmm. the next episode has to start with him oh yeah we have to get that resolved before right the end something needs to occur i don't think we're gonna get a denouement i think it's gonna lead off into like like the, i think they're gonna allow the galaxy's denouement to happen in whatever show they're telling next again i was like oh it's probably gonna be the path where they're helping these like force sensitives and it's quinlan right. voss and and Ventress maybe are like helping force sensitives because like we have all this like force sensitive bounty Discussion. hunter stuff happening and like this is right around when the path is probably starting and we know Quinlan Voss is around with Kenobi so or at least he wrote his name on a wall he graffitied his name on the wall at yeah. one point so oh sorry oh can we yeah. go back i want to talk quickly about dr scalder oh because she's terrible <clears throat> okay i just but, said she was just judgmental and uh, suspicious but um helen scalder is actually the voice actor who does ray in all of the lego star wars oh so i just wanted that's to great i just want to jump in there because like that was pretty cool and that's well, like they're finding a new use for her so yeah <laughs> wait is her is her name the same as the doctor's name Helen Scalder. Oh, uh, Dr. Scalder is played by Helen Sadler. Oh, Sadler. Okay. Yes. Sorry. You said Scalder. So that's uh, cool. Yeah. Yes. Welcome back. You do a great Ray. Yeah, I, I think so too. And now you're a great, terrible, evil judgmental scientist. Doctor. Not even just judgmental, but like well, she's a bit suspicious. Suspicious doctor. That's a better way to put it. Okay. Yeah. Back to speculation. Right. Land. Speculation land. I, I mean, I don't think that we're going to get, I think it's going to end the story for the Bad Batch, but I don't think we're going to actually get the denouement that I want. So well, that's okay. They're going to have to do something because Batcher is left on the planet. He's just gone. Oh, they abandoned him. Yeah. They, they don't have a ship. Right. And like that, that's something I'm constantly re remembering as well is that their ship was blown up. The Marauder is gone. Betcher could be babysat by a fee. Sure. Or taken care of by the mayor. Like there's no mm -hmm. fee left with them to go and do the whole so Batcher's gun on, and run thing. Batcher's on Pabu. They could just literally all of them land on Pabu. And like that's the end of the story. And, and we running up. Yeah. And we sunset. see we see the sunset like literally sunrise. So I, I think. Sunrise would be good. Yeah. Literally, that would be sad, like denouement enough for me to be like, oh, they're going to be OK. Yeah. They're back home. So this is the problem with pets and kids. Is <laughs> yeah, yeah we talked writing, about that. We talked about this. Badger oh, has to be cut out because he can't have a she can't have a place in this story. Yeah. But I mean, I think that if Omega is returned to Badger and they they have a moment and then they're all like surrounding her like we got the gist absolutely the gist of what's happening yeah. um x2 resolution with x2 it, i is there time you have 40 minutes i think i think they could oh, i don't know yes my concern I mean, is you have five five children including omega omega has to save four other kids Omega has to deal with Hemlock or Emery Carr has to deal with Hemlock. I think if that's it's more the likely Emery Carr is going to deal with Hemlock. But then also that we have to have a resolution for Dr. Carr. Yeah. Right. And then the batch also has to play into this. And Rampart is still there. Yes, absolutely. And Echo is still there. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of people still there. So there are a lot of moving parts. Um, Do you think Rampart's going to die? 
I, does he need to? I don't think we have enough time for Rampart Redemption. Uh, I think it's likely he's going to be like what they do when like he he's like uh, he's a victim of his own evil or something like that. Mm. Right. Something like that. It happens. Right. Like so he he dies because he was too evil in the moment or something. That's that's the way I think that they're going to handle him. I think he's going to die. I'm literally just going to open up my phone and see if they've announced who the writers are for the last two episodes. Because if we knew who the writers were in the last two episodes, I feel like I could I could make stronger prognostications. Uh-huh. They have not. There's nothing that's been no. revealed for other than the fact that <laughs> created by Dave Filoni and D. Bradley Baker. <laughs> that's it. Yes, you're the voice of all the clones. We knew that, sir. Oh, and Sammy is in this episode. <laughs> Sammy talks in this episode. That's all we know so far. Top okay. cast. There's two people in the cast. Sammy and D. Bradley Baker. Cool. Um, Sammy, who did not talk. Are there things that you want to have happen? Um, I would like S2 to be... X2, yeah. Tech. I would like that to be the case. Mm-hmm. I want Tech and Fee to go off and have a merry life together. Yes, I want of, uh, of intellectual piratism. Emery to redeem herself. Yeah, I mean we confrontation all, with her hemlock. Got it? No, she I mean she's on the way. Freed Omega the first time, and then gave the doll to the child. We've already gotten all the tools she, she to didn't say that free was, Omega. She didn't not. Eh, she didn't stand in the right? way. That's the difference, exactly. right? So she's already on her way. But I want her to make the active choice to do Agreed. the right thing, and then. Be saved with them, right? Yeah. Leave the underworld. I want Hunter and Wrecker and Crosshair and Tech to be together. Yeah. And none of them to die. I want them to have, like, I want, but the thing is, we've got 40 minutes to get, to get Omega saved or not saved because they're not going to save Omega. Omega is going to save herself. Oh, yeah. Like, they don't need to save Omega. They're the ride. They're not, I mean, they're not even that, are they really? Well, they could capture a ship, theoretically. Well, because um, they have this imp- this row class ship. They have this shuttle. Do you think Echo makes it out? Echo has to make it out. Echo base, Echo base, Echo base. Has so, to be his base. I am, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm. Does Rampart make it out? Does he sacrifice himself? Does he join the rebellion? I hope he joins the rebellion. Yes. I mean, there's so many different choices that could be made here. He's got the facial hair. He can join the rebellion. Jennifer (laughs) Corbett is a former military individual who took on this job and took on all of this, these stories because she wanted to write post-war stories from the perspective of someone who has lived post-war yeah because a lot of those stories have that she has they seen haven't been told haven't yeah. been told or not told in the right way they're mm-hmm. told in like the hurt locker way mm-hmm. and she wants to write stories from that perspective and we got that in season one there was a mm-hmm. lot of that in season one who are we what do we do how do we fight how do, how we, do fit? we how do we live now and now that they've kind of found at least a path forward. Right. Right. And also their desires of, well, we want to create a better life for this kid and thus ourselves at the same yep. time. They just need to be able to enable that. But it's not, they keep on going back to this idea that it's not just them. They have to save all of them. Yeah. And so that's where I think like, I'm really leaning into the path being the next story that they're going to be telling. Yeah. Because, it makes sense that they could tell that story of like how the path is organized. Yeah. And we might even get like Riva as a character in the path. Well, the next two episodes are called flash strike and the cavalry has arrived. So maybe Rex arrives. I, I'm going to presume that. The Although Rebellion who knows with re- the titles. Again, these are like, <laughs> They don't tell you anything. The cavalry is literally like, like maybe Flash Strike is like related to Omega and X2. And then suddenly it's like the bat shows up and saves the day. Maybe. I don't, 
I don't know. I can't. I can't. I can't with these titles. I they have lost it on me. I have. I've listened to you too much, and I agree with you now. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, any final thoughts for this episode as we go into the? It end? was one of the most touching moments in the show when Omega looks at the kids, tells them, "I've already escaped here once. We're gonna do this." And all of the kids perk and they turn yeah. and they look at her in that subtle way and omega says and i'm doing it again and i'm taking you all with me that's amazing because like that that's very meaningful to me from what tantus represents and like yep. you know even in the darkest lowest area of hell yep right and now i'm picturing omega all shoeless bloodied in a wife beater, climbing through the vents of Tantus, <laughs> oh, like- a la John McClane and Die Hard, <laughs> pulling these kids on a rope behind her. I compared this episode when we were watching to uh, a couple of my favorite episodes, which was uh, of Star Trek The Next Generation, mm. which is Little Rascals when uh, the the captain and, and friends gets turned into yep. kids. And then also there's the episode where uh, Captain Picard has to hang out with four children yep. and they have to climb up the elevator. Yep. And I was like, the, this has all of the vibes of that episode where Captain Picard has to climb up the elevator with the three kids and he gives out his like captain pins. And you're like, you're my number one and you're a lieutenant and you're in charge of the plant that you're carrying around. <laughs> like, it's like literally that to me, the three you know, with the baby, you know, in tow, but it, it has this, those vibes. And I hope that that's the story that they're telling. Yeah. And, and I will say this, it is the greatest heist I've ever seen these two episodes in a sitcom or, and, and possibly even in it's, it's mission impossible in its own way and its execution. Like they give you the details that you need to understand to put you know, an, uh, an yeah. intellectual reason for why they're there and why it's wrong and what they have to do to fix it. And then they resolve that in an interesting way that leaves you on your edge of your seat the whole time. It's it's really, really well done storytelling and then visual storytelling as well. Yeah. I'm really excited. All right. Yep. All right, friends. Kyle and I are done for the this this episode that we are we will be back ooh, maybe next episode or the episode for every all the finale for all the marbles yeah i don't that, know that it, may be the name uh, proper name of the final episode <laughs> we'll see uh it's been hard to record every single week so we've been delaying it for the two weeks but if we feel so inspired we will definitely be back pre the finale exactly All right. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is Orchestral Music by Christy Crew for What the Force. You can support the show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash whattheforce. We'd like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love and are obsessed with What the Force. Sarah Joy, John, In Wild Space, How Rude, Anna Perez, Neil, Christian Luca, Carly Ann, Scott C., and Susan. You can support the show by wearing The Force at our merch store or like and subscribe on YouTube or leave a five-star review on iTunes or any other pod apps. It helps people find the show. You can connect to us on Twitter, on Facebook, or at whattheforce.ca or our Discord. Links are in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers. Cheers.